the shuttle sitting out on the launch pad the night during the night time as we're sleeping and getting ready, or some of us were sleeping, I guess the blue shift was up and about. Uh, they woke the red shift up about five hours before launch, which is fairly standard. Uh, we went in to have some breakfast, went, went to a weather briefing, and then immediately uh, went in to get our suits on. Of course, in the suit room, we checked the uh, suits for pressure integrity. There's Terry again. Tom, and he's the one in the orange suit. <laughs> Steve. And Dan and Jeff. And of course, we uh, take off from the crew quarters. It's a fairly standard scene, I guess. Jump on the Astro van and head out to the pad where we get on board about two and a half hours before launch. You'll see in just a second uh, the water deluge coming down, the engine starting, and this time starting for good. Uh, a little twang, and again, uh, when the solid rocket motors. Uh, Ignite, you're going uh, out of town very quickly. It was a beautiful launch. It felt great uh, on board. We jumped right up to two and a half Gs, did our roll maneuver, throttled down, uh, and had a very, uh, I guess, nominal ascent. No uh, failures of any sort. It's very nice. Yes, the ascent and the expression uh, we were kicked off the pad is a is an accurate one. Here's a pretty spectacular view of us penetrating a, a cloud layer. During an ascent, you can see the reflection off the clouds. And the dark line off to the left there is, of course, the shadow from our exhaust plume. It took us eight and a half minutes to get to space. Uh, here come the sod rockets being kicked off the ET. If you watch carefully, you can see their exhaust uh, tail off. And eight and a half minutes later, after liftoff, of course, we get rid of the ET tank and we're in space. We got the payload bay doors open, and uh, Steve opened them up, and Dan took these pictures. Uh, you can see the port door going open, and it exposes the cargo bay in the space radar lab to uh, Earth for the first time. And the large slab-sided antenna is visible on the left. That's Sir C. XR is the tilted, folded segment up against its upper right corner. And the MAPS carbon monoxide pollution sensor is on the bridge structure at the forward end of the bay. Now, inside, we were activating ourselves, too. We got all our cameras out. We had 14 cameras to document the radar uh, science on board, and the MAPS uh, pollution science. There's a large Linhoff mapping camera, and I'm holding a Hasselblad uh, telephoto lens. We took about 14,000 shots to document the science on board. In addition to taking a lot of pictures, we changed out uh, tapes on board, which recorded the data. Uh, this uh, radar puts out a, enough information. It's like 45 TV channels broadcasting at once. And uh, by the end of the flight, we had enough data that could have uh, equivalent to uh, floppy disk stacked up 15 mi miles high, so it was quite a quite amount of data that we brought back. One of the recorders uh, failed in flight, so we had to change it out. This is the failed recorder getting ready to be put back under the floor. Now the radar needed to be pointed uh, while we were up there in the right direction to all the, the uh, sites on the ground. Here I am typing in one of the 400 plus maneuvers that it took. Uh, each shift ended up doing about 11,000 keystrokes. This is a view that we didn't see too often. About every 24 hours, we had to point the star trackers, which are located on the nose of the shuttle, towards the stars to align our inertial measurement units on board. And um, here we are coasting down, uh, traveling southeast over uh, India, the west, west coast of India. Once we get the radar set up and ready to go, it's ready to start taking data. And the next scene that you're going to see is a picture of us passing over the Sahara Desert. As you can see that to the eye, it doesn't look very like there are many features. But when you turn the radar on, this is what the radar can see underneath the ground or ancient riverbeds. Uh, and that was part of our study. This was a geological site that we wanted to understand the history of how the Sahara Desert became what it is today. Because obviously, its climate in the past must have been very different to have these riverbeds underneath. Now, we were looking into Earth's past history here in the Sahara. But we also got a chance to see some of the dynamic geology going on on Earth. Uh, on launch day, the Klutchevskoy volcano erupted on, up on Kamchatka. And you can see the uh, ash and smoke plume going up over 50,000 feet here from this uh, nadir view. You can even make out the lava flows going down the uh, snow-covered sides of the volcano. And that ash plume was blown by the jet stream well out to the east, several hundred miles uh, downstream. And the, the sight of this uh, plume blowing downwind was really amazing each day when we came up over the horizon and saw this plume waiting for us over Kamchatka. 
And volcanoes were an important part of our uh, studies on board. We were looking at 15 dangerous ones around the world that endanger populated areas. After a snowfall, Klutchevskoy was uh, almost uh, pristine again. You couldn't even tell that it had erupted. But in our radar, radar data here, you can see uh, in this uh, false color image the ash colored in red on the mountain slopes and the lime green uh, lava flow that was freshly generated during our flight uh, coming downslope towards the uh, Kamchatka River Valley. And I had actually brought up a, a small volcanic rock on board to uh, give a little talk about our volcanic studies, and we hoped by unraveling the past eruptive histories of these mountains to tell you about the future hazards of them. Well, we worked uh, 24 hours uh, around the clock up there, and uh, this is uh, two out of the three people on the blue shift with uh, Tom on the left, uh, myself on the right, and Steve Smith um, is the one out of that uh, picture. Here we are coming over Australia. It was clear, although uh, several fires, and we would point out these fires and, and indicate when there were fires so the MAPS instrument could correlate that to their measurements of carbon monoxide that they were making. Here we are coming over the Philippine Islands, and uh, this is three times normal speed, so we really don't go that fast. And um, you can see the reflections off the water. We can actually see several hundred feet beneath the surface because of what these internal waves do to the uh, surface of the water. You can't detect with the naked eye, but you can with the reflections. And uh, to con continue the blue team's um, explanation of what we saw here, I, I welcomed you to the rooftop of the world. That's the, what this area is called. This is Tibet. Uh, even the valleys in this area are 15 to 20,000 feet above sea level. This is one of the beautiful sights we saw. The blue team saw the earth lit from Europe all the way through New Zealand. This was always one of our personal favorites to see the uh, beautiful iceberg colored lakes up in uh, the Tibetan highlands. And you see off in the distance there is uh, the Himalayas and past that is India. As Tom said, we took 14,000 pictures. It kept us very busy. It was uh, often a competition to get to any certain window. This is Dan looking out the commander's window. We were rolled slightly so the commander's window looked at earth. It was always nice to be able to pass the camera so easily. Uh, we always had time for uh, a little bit of fun as we prepared our meals here. This is uh, the way our meals were packed. This is uh, me bringing up the lunch tray here and uh, showing Tom and Dan what they could have. We often ate on the fly for lunch very quickly. Uh, we did have more time for dinner. Uh, before we went to sleep, we often went down downstairs, which we call the mid-deck. That's Dan eating dinner on the ceiling, uh, me on the left, and Tom doing a last-minute uh, film change before we went to sleep. Well, uh, everybody knows that uh, Mike Baker is so cool, calm, and collect, it's really hard to spin him up, so this is the only way I've found on orbit to do it. Uh, behind us there, you see the uh, sleep bunks um, that we used. I couldn't quite get into it the same way that I learned as I was growing up, and uh, it takes a while to practice to do it without banging your head too much, but uh, it was nice to have those, and... Uh, well, even though the shuttle was designed to be autonomous, you never can quite escape the ground, <laughs> and, nor would we want to. This is how we started every shift. Uh, we'd get a new uh, attitude timeline, science timeline up from the ground and uh, changes to the flight plan. Like Dan said earlier, we had over 400 maneuvers we had to manually type in, and that equated to over 22,000 keystrokes. Every night pass, uh, which was half our time up there, we would spend uh, going over the flight plan, seeing what secondary activities we had to do, and also reviewing the, uh, our uh, onboard maps to study what land sites we were going to pass over. In this upcoming scene, you'll be able to tell that this is a California pass because you can watch our commander get ready to take pictures of his home state. And you see you're getting fairly excited here because we're getting ready to go over California. This is San Francisco Bay Area, San Jose. You see the Sacramento area here the Central Valley of California. Down here at the very bottom of the screen is Monterey Bay. And right in here somewhere is Fresno and Lemoore's where I'm from. At the top you can see the snow-capped Sierra Nevada Mountains. And then pretty soon here you'll see this V is the San Andreas Fault and the Garlock Fault that come together right here. And right in there is Edwards uh, Lake Bed. And then you'll be able to see Los Angeles and uh, JPL. It's right in this area. San Diego right there. And at the top of the screen is the Salton Sea. And this uh, light brown area you see in there is a large plankton bloom, a large agri agricultural area in the Colorado River Basin, and the Colorado River Delta that opens up into uh, Baja. And of course, on the bottom of the screen is the uh, uh, Baja, California. 
And then you can see as we look back over the uh, pass that we just made, you can see Baja extending off into the north. In addition to uh, passes down California that were spectacular, this is the Chesapeake Bay area. You can see Baltimore up here, and Washington's just going off the screen there. Here's uh, Potomac coming up uh, to the Washington area. This area is very important because it acts as a nursery for fish, and uh, one of our prime sites was to study uh, the Gulf Stream just off of the shore of uh, eastern Virginia. And as we pass down here, you can now see uh, north of Virginia, my hometown, and uh, Armwell Sound, and down here, is Cape Hatteras, and of course Kitty Hawk, where the great adventure started, is just down there. So this is a nice view looking south going off the coast, and uh, just off the coast here would be the Gulf Stream area, which we would study in Sunglint with our cameras. This is a picture of uh, South America looking uh, north along the Andes. This particular area here is what we used as kind of our visual aid in helping locate where we were. Coquimba, Chile is right uh, in that bight along the coast. And as you cross over the Andes here, it almost looks very three-dimensional. There were a number of mountains and volcanoes that were of interest as geology sites. In addition to our mission to planet Earth primary payloads, we also had several experiments in the crew cabin. Here I am setting up a 100-pound uh, chair, which is very easy to manipulate in space for a, a head and eye movement experiment. Here Terry has a laser mounted to his head, and he uh, and I both did this experiment where we moved the laser uh, to follow a target that was on the forward bulkhead. And again, it was to, to judge how well our eyes were working with our head movements. And we actually saw some degradation during space. That's the target on the forward bulkhead. We also had to do daily maintenance uh, to clean out filters. Uh, anything that's loose flying within the shuttle actually ends up on these filters as they draw the air to them. That's the commercial protein crystal growth experiment, uh, growing crystals of an anti-cancer drug. So we just use gray tape to clean all those filters every day. Well. Here I am caught again playing with my food. <laughs> Actually, if you'll watch this, you'll see some pretty interesting fluid dynamics. Of course, what I'm trying to do is keep that uh, tropical punch off my shirt. Success. Here's an exercise period. Uh, Bakes and Jeff, if you look carefully, you'll notice that uh, Bakes is the only one with an ergometer. Here's Jeff with a uh, model of the Starship uh, Enterprise and also a model of the shuttle. He took these up there because he knew that was the only thing Bakes and I were going to let him fly. <laughs> Here's uh, Terry and I coming up to the flight deck to get ready to do one of the uh, 14 uh, trim burns that we did for the interferometry data takes towards the end of the mission. Uh, Dan put together a nice procedure along with the help of the Fidos to uh, get these burns trimmed down to an unprecedented accuracy of about 0.05 feet per second for the Delta V goes. Uh, and we were able to successfully uh, perform those burns and get the orbiter to within 200 feet of where it was uh, the day before and also within 200 feet of where the Endeavour was in April on the first uh, flight of SRL. It's a pretty uh, remarkable feat, I think. This is an example of what the acceleration of, of the uh, plus X jets will do uh, to the folks on the mid-deck. We put together the images from last April and October over Long Valley, California, an old volcanic crater in California, to make this three-dimensional topographic map, the whole objective of this interferometry experiment. And this, this is digital topography made from the radar without any contour elevations from the ground. Now, the radar was uh, cooking throughout the whole 10 or 11 days of science, but eventually we started to run out of film. Here it is piling up, exposed in our uh, storage bags on board. And when we ran down out of film, the radar was also running down its investigations. There's Mike and Jeff waving goodbye from the crew cabin. And while the sun was setting on SRL, too, we were also getting ourselves set up to come back for uh, entry day, uh, hopefully to Florida, but we wound up in California. As you can see, we've turned our orbiting laboratory into uh, a reentry vehicle and also an airplane. Jeff on the right there, there's a shot towards uh, Bakes. So you see out the window the glow of the atmosphere as we start to reenter and the hot plasma gases as they come over the uh, orbiter uh, periodically meet at overhead and, and cause bright flashes. There's looking over uh, Terry's shoulder on the right hand side, the pilot, and uh, you see the uh, sunset there and there it's uh, Bakes flying. At this point, you know, we take over manually at about 50,000 feet overhead the uh, runway and uh, fly it around the heading alignment cone. And here you see us turning on the final just prior to doing our subsonic uh, 
DTO or flight test, there's a little wing rack, which is about all the motion that you see out of the aileron doublet and the uh, yaw doublet that we did. We're coming down 18 degree glide path at 300 knots. At 2,000 feet, we performed the pre-flare to reduce our glide path to about one and a half degrees. At 300 feet, Terry put the gear down. And we crossed the threshold at about uh, 235 knots and 35 feet. Looking for a touchdown about 200. We touched down at 195, about one foot per second on the sink rate. And we were also doing the drag chute flight test, so we put the chute out immediately on uh, main gear touchdown. Uh, allowed it to fully deploy, and uh, from touchdown to the start of derotation was about 15 knots. Started the derotation, got the nose on the ground about 130 knots, and uh, started braking about 80 knots. And at 60 knots, you'll see in a second, we'll jettison the chute and came to a stop about 12,000 feet down the runway with 3,000 feet remaining. It's a great flying machine. Uh, it was a joy to fly on this mission to planet Earth. And it was, uh, landing was a nice ending to a successful mission. Great landing. <laughs> Thank you.